Hi, and welcome to Dr. Archer's Lectures. When we were together the last time, we talked a lot about the banking system and how banks worked. We talked about the fractional reserve system. We're going to go into a little more depth than that in this lecture, and then also talk about how that relates to the size of the money supply and how the Federal Reserve controls the size of the money supply through the banks. So let's get started first with a quick review of how that fractional reserve banking works. Remember this equation? This one right here, total reserves equals required reserves plus excess reserves. When money comes into the bank, when I deposit $100 into my checking account, that becomes part of the bank's total reserves, that $100. That $100 includes both the required reserves and the excess reserves, both are included there. The required reserves are the portion of that money that the Federal Reserve says has to be held at the bank. Why does the Federal Reserve require reserves? So that if I go back to the bank tomorrow and say, I wanna withdraw my $100, the bank in fact has $100 to give me. So these are required reserves. And let's say that the required reserve ratio that the Federal Reserve has set is 10%. So if I deposit $100, the bank is obligated to set aside 10%, $10, as its required reserves. But anything that's not required reserves is excess reserves. So $90 of that money is excess reserves. And what does the bank do with excess reserves? They loan them out. Banks make their profit. They make money by loaning money to customers and collecting interest on those loans. The interest on the loans is the bank's profit. So they have some incentive to loan out those excess reserves. Excess reserves are simply everything the bank has in excess of their required reserves. And the minimum reserve requirement directly limits how much the bank, how many deposits the bank can create, how much they can lend. Okay, let's back up for a minute and think about that. When the bank loans money, it goes to a borrower, the borrower deposits that money into his account, so now there's a new bank deposit. You'll remember that the M1 money supply includes all bank deposits. So if we've created a new bank deposit, we have in fact increased the money supply. Follow? So when the bank loans money, it creates new deposits. And when those new deposits are created, it increases the money supply. But their ability to loan and to increase the money supply is limited by this required reserve ratio. If the Federal Reserve says they have to keep 10% in reserve, then they would have to keep $10 out of that 100 set aside and they could loan 90. If the Federal Reserve said no, I think we're gonna make that required reserve ratio 20%. Now the bank would have to set aside $20 and could only loan 80. So you see how those relate. So the bank makes loans. Each loan creates a new bank deposit. The borrower puts the money into his bank account and each new bank deposit increases the money supply. This is the circular flow that we talked about a little bit in our last lecture. The public deposits money into the bank. When the, money, when the bank gets the money, they don't hold it in the back room. No, no, no. They set aside their required reserve, 10% or whatever that number is, and then the balance they loan to other customers. And that loan ends up in the borrower's hands and the borrower puts that money into his bank account 
and it again becomes a new deposit, the bank sets aside the required reserve and loans the balance out and it all repeats. And this just goes around and around and around in a circle. Each time the money goes through the bank, the money supply is increased and the bank has to set aside required reserves. So ultimately, all of the money will be exhausted, consumed in required reserves. But how far can it go? How much could the money supply be increased by that single deposit? Well, it could become a big arithmetic problem, but there's an easier way to find it. We use what's called the money multiplier. The money multiplier is the amount of deposit dollars, new deposit dollars, that the banking system can create from $1 of excess reserves. So $1 of excess reserves can create how many dollars of, of, of deposits in the banking system? And the way we find this money multiplier, it turns out, is it's just one divided by the required reserve ratio. So if the required reserve ratio was 10%, this would be 1 divided by 0 0.10, which is the decimal equivalent of 10%. 1 divided by 0 0.10 is 10, and so your money multiplier would be 10. So that means that every dollar of excess reserves would create $10 in new bank deposits. So excess reserves times the money multiplier equals the potential deposit creation. Let's look at another example just to make sure we have that down. If the required reserve ratio is 20%, 0 0.20, the money multiplier is going to be five, right? One divided by 0 0.20 gives you five. An initial deposit of $100, not all of this is excess reserves, right? If 20% is the required reserve ratio, we have to set aside the first 20, but then we have $80 of excess reserves. So it's the money multiplier, 5, times the excess reserves, 80, means that we can create $400 in new deposits by the time this has gone all the way through the bank. If this is, this is an important function of banks. This is one of two main functions of banks. Banks exist for two primary reasons. The first is simply to transfer money from savers to lenders. Savers put their money into the bank for safekeeping. The bank loans that money to spenders. Why would that be important? Why would they even bother with that? Because in making those loans, first of all, the bank makes its profit on the interest that it collects. That's its profit. But in addition to that, and separate from that, the bank creates money. It actually increases the money supply because each new deposit is an, an addition to the money supply. Now, why do we care how big the money supply is? The size of the money supply affects spending behavior. So if the money supply is very large, if there's money readily available, lots of money to loan, banks will tend to offer very low consumer interest rates or low business rates, and people will borrow money to buy cars and homes and furniture and maybe equipment and uh, 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 buildings and things for their business. That all creates a shift in the aggregate demand. Aggregate just means the demand overall. So the entire demand curve would shift right if the money supply grew. 
if the money supply contracts, if it shrinks, that all moves in the opposite direction, right? If the money supply shrinks, well, then there's not as much money available to loan in the economy. Banks have fewer reserves on hand to loan. That means they might uh, raise their, their interest rates on personal loans a little bit. So people will be less likely to buy that car, less likely to buy that house, less likely to expand that business. And the aggregate demand curve shifts left. So the size of the money supply is very important in determining the what happens with the money with the demand curve. It would seem that growing the money supply and just continuing to ex, to shift that aggregate demand curve to the right, to the right, to the right, farther and farther and farther might be a good idea. But there are some natural constraints on that. And the first one is deposits. All of this requires that people deposit their cash into the bank. If for some reason people stopped doing that, people stopped using banks and held their money as cash, then this whole circle would be, would be screeching to a halt. If people held their money as cash and never put it into the banks, there would be no bank reserves to start with. But let's say that there are bank reserves, that the banks have the money, but they're just not willing to lend it. If banks don't lend the money, then there aren't any loans being made, so the money supply does not increase. Just the mere fact that the banks have the reserves is not enough to increase the money supply. Likewise, if you want to make a loan, you have to have a lender, but you also have to have a borrower, right? So if, if consumers are reluctant to take out loans, if they don't want to borrow money, if they're feeling cautious or skittish about the economy and they won't take out loans, this too blocks the creation of money. And finally, there's the regulation piece. If the Federal Reserve decides to increase the reserve ratio, well, then the banks would be able to loan out less money. Likewise, if the Federal Reserve decided to reduce the reserve ratio, banks would be able to loan out more money. That's one of the three tools available to the Federal Reserve as a way to control the size of the money supply. I must tell you that this is used very rarely because banks don't like uncertainty. To change that reserve ratio around a lot would make it very difficult for banks to plan and to do business. So it's not used often. The second Federal Reserve policy is changing the discount rate. So the Federal Reserve is required to keep a certain amount of its reserves on hand to, to meet withdrawal demands and so on and so forth. But sometimes if a bank is very aggressive and they're lending, they can come up at the end of the day and they can come up short of their reserve requirement. In that case, what they do is they borrow money from the Fed. And the rate at which they borrow that money is, has everything to do with whether they're willing to do that. If the rate is high, well, they might, they might be much more careful and make sure that they never have to borrow money from the Fed. So they would keep more reserves than are actually required. On the other hand, if that discount rate is low, they might be more free with their lending and might might not worry about running short because they can borrow money at this cheap rate. This also moves the size of the money supply very little. It's not something that's changed often, and it's not something where you see big swings in the money supply. What really changes the money supply is this third one, open market operations. Open market operations is the Federal Reserve's ability to buy 
and sell government bonds. That changes the money supply. But before we talk about exactly how that works, let's remind ourselves quickly. The money supply includes all the money that's deposited in the banks. It's the money in the banks as well as cash and things like traveler's checks. It does not include money that's tied up in investment accounts like stocks, bonds, or government securities, government bonds. So keep that firmly in mind. If you want to increase the money supply, you have to get more money into the banks. If you want to decrease the money supply, you have to get money out of the banks and into these investment vehicles. So here's how it works. When the Fed buys government bonds, they go to the individuals that are holding the bonds and they say, I'll give you cash for that bond. The, the, the bondholder says, yes, I'll take that deal. They turn over the bond, they get money for that bond. What are you going to do with that money? You're going to put it in the bank. So you have a new bank deposit. When there are new bank deposits, the money supply grows. And that's exactly what happens. When the Fed buys government bonds, the money supply grows because the bank's reserves grow. Why would the Fed do that? Remember when we were talking about aggregate demand just a minute ago, and we were talking about that when the money supply is growing, when there's a lot of money around to lend, then um, interest rates on things like consumer loans and things like that tend to be lower, and people are more apt to buy cars and houses and expand their business and all those things, and aggregate demand tends to shift to the right. At during times of unemployment, this is an important consideration because when demand shifts to the right, suppliers would tend to increase their output to meet that demand. And one of the, way, one of the things that suppliers are going to need in order to increase their output is more workers. So this is a way to reduce the unemployment rate, increase aggregate demand, to reduce the unemployment rate. And the way we increase aggregate demand is to increase the money supply so the Fed would buy government bonds to increase the money supply. Now, what if we wanted things to go the other direction? When the Fed sells government bonds, it all moves in reverse. So if as an individual, I decide that I'd like to buy one of those government bonds that's for sale, I'm going to take the money out of my bank account to invest in this government bond. Now I have a government bond, but that money is no longer in the bank. If the money's not in the bank, it's not part of the money supply, the money supply just shrunk. When the money supply shrinks, what you have is um, fewer dollars available in the economy. So there's not as much money available to lend. Banks have fewer reserves. They don't have as much money to lend. When there's less money to lend, it tends to inch up interest rates for things like cars, houses, business expansion, all those kinds of things. And people are less likely to make those purchases. They won't take out a loan because the interest rates are edging up. Why would the Federal Reserve choose to do this? They would do that in times of inflation. If inflation is heating up, if prices are rising too fast, if you reduce the money supply, it will just quiet down demand and allow those prices to settle down so that you don't have this big inflation. So you increase the money supply to reduce unemployment, you decrease the money supply to decrease inflation. If you're trying to increase the money supply, the Fed would buy government bonds. If you want to decrease the money supply, the Fed would sell government bonds. And that's all we have today.
for Dr. Archer's lecture. I hope you'll be with me next time when we'll talk more about international trade. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much.